I'm very pleased to introduce to you our final panelist, uh, Dr. Lindsay Montgomery of the University of Arizona. Dr. Montgomery is an anthropological archaeologist who focuses on the material practices of mobile groups during the late pre-contact and colonial periods in the American Southwest. Her research employs a collaborative and multidisciplinary approach, which brings together archaeological, archival, oral, historical, and ethnographic sources to understand the social practices of mobile groups, such as the Ute, the Jicaria Apache, the Comanche, and the Comanche. Dr. Montgomery has overseen a collaborative research project with the Pecuris Pueblo in Northern New Mexico that explores the social and economic relationships between Pecuris Pueblo and the Jicaria Apache through an investigation of agricultural practices at the Pueblo between 1400 and 1750 CE. Dr. Montgomery is currently a Radcliffe Fellow at Harvard University, where she is working on a full-length monograph entitled, We Take Our Place With Us, which documents the deep history of mobile land use practices on the Taos Plateau, the Taos Plateau. So thank you so much, Lindsay, it's great to have you here. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation um, to participate. Uh, and so far, I feel like a lot of the things that come up in my paper have actually already been uh, discussed, um, but hopefully I'll be able to add a kind of new lens, a new angle to this. So this is a technical question to share my screen. It's saying that I can't screen share right now. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were made host. Let's see. Maybe Ken or Hillary can jump. I'm also happy to just talk. Yep. Oh, I'm not here. Let's see. Um, mm -hmm. While they're sorting that out, I just want to acknowledge that I'm broadcasting to y'all from the unceded territories and traditional homelands of the Tohono O'odham and Pascoyaki peoples. Um, and as Keisha brought up, Zoom has made land acknowledgement. Um, very, uh, very interesting kind of um, thing to think about how we go about acknowledging um, land and how we create uh, a space for indigenous people in these kind of virtual spheres um, uh, at the same time that we might not be connecting to each other in that place. So let's see. You should be good to go. There you go. Okay, great. So what does it mean to indigenize archaeology? To me, there's something a little funny about the idea that you could indigenize a discipline which has served as the handmaiden of US settler colonialism and which continues through various different means to disempower indigenous people. While we can't deny the colonial origins of anthropological archaeology, the concept of indigenizing it should not be dismissed out of hand. In fact, I'd like to suggest that the language of indigenizing embodies a more empowering set of potential practices than the concept of decolonization with its roots in post-colonial thought. Decolonization operates primarily as an aspirational ideology rather than an actualizable idea within contexts like the United States and Canada, in which settler colonialism persists. Rather than proposing to undo the trauma of colonization and its ongoing power dynamics, indigenizing is a future-oriented concept focused on supporting indigenous sovereignty. Cherokee scholar Daniel Heath Justice has argued that indigenizing the academy means to, quote, make the academy both responsive and responsible to First Nation goals of self-determination and well-being. Building on the efforts of uh, Heath Justice, as well as Devon Mahuzana and colleagues in indigenizing the academy, I suggest that indigenizing archeology span means carving out a space within the discipline where indigenous values and knowledge are respected, creating an intellectual culture that supports research methods which actually serve indigenous nation building efforts and compelling academics to respond directly to indigenous concerns and communities. Replacing decolonizing with indigenizing is more than just a semantic shift. It's a powerful rhetorical pivot, which linguistically removes the colonists and the colonial status quo as the objects of theoretical and methodological focus and replaces these constructs with indigenous people. This terminological switch is the first step in building a liberatory discourse within archeology, span which presences rather than erases indigenous people. So in my time today, I wanna to propose two different methodological and theor theoretical techniques, um, slipstream thinking and trickster hermeneutics. 
drawn from the writing of Anishinaabe scholar Gerald Visnor that Craig mentioned. And I argue that we can use these ideas to indigenize how we as archaeologists write narrative histories. So these concepts are grounded in the oral tradition of storytelling, which fosters an active dialogue between listeners, narrator, reader, and writer. Slipstream literature refers to a form of kind of fantastic, surreal, speculative writing, which defies simplistic categorization within a literary genre. When taken up by native authors, slipstreaming provides a nonlinear way of thinking through complex cultural tensions and social constructs. And it reflects indigenous worldviews and experiences of reality. This literary approach is exemplified by visitor's short story, Custer on the Slipstream, which disrupts the myth of General George Armstrong Custer an American, as an American victim hero by exposing him as a devious loser intent on personal gain. To do so, Visnor reincarnates the historical figure of Custer in the literary character of Border, a chauvinistic Bureau of Indian Affairs agent who is driven quite literally mad by a similarly reincarnated crazy horse who refuses to play the role of indigenous victim. In narrating an encounter between Border and crazy horse, Visnor plays with the literal and the figurative, past and present, powerful and powerless. As part of a Native American critical theory, slipstreaming is a narrative technique which renders taken for granted concepts strange by critically examining their epistemological and ontological bases. This approach resembles the efforts of post-structuralists and post-colonial writers like Derrida and Baba who deconstruct oppositional binary thinking and concepts of identity. Visitor's application of slipstreaming also draws heavily on the work of Jean Baudrillard in Simulacra and Simulations in an effort to challenge dominant notions of what is real or what is true. When used as a theoretical lens within anthropology, Visitor's brand of Anishinaabe post-structuralism reveals how archeological concepts like cultural phases or artifact categories are really just simulations of the lived experiences of indigenous people. One way in which native slipstreaming upends dominant paradigms of knowledge production is by moving the reader back and forth between various temporal scales in order to disrupt linear notions of time. The dominant mode of thought in social science is based on an A plus B equals C logic, which uses empirical evidence to assess the relationship between each of the variables in that equation. This is what Muscogee Creek scholar Donald Fixico calls linear thinking. Archaeology is full of examples of linear thinking, which has been used to kind of model the development of agriculture, the development of social hierarchy, the development of state level societies. Rather than looking for cause and effect relationships, native slipstreaming engages in circular thinking in which chronology is set aside for cycles and the past, present, and future become a single analytical framework. This is an important intervention because chronological time has often been used by the settler colonial state to distinguish between contemporary indigenous people and the indigenous people who are the subjects of archeological histories, as we kind of touched on in the last discussion. A distinction which has hindered indigenous claims to land, water, and political rights. For archeologists, slipstream thinking means moving away from documenting change over time in a kind of classic historical sense, and instead describing ongoing processes and evolving social relationships. Of course, this is not a totally new or uniquely indigenous suggestion. For example, relation-centered approaches, which Ali talked about, um, emphasize these kind of emergent qualities of relations. Um, or, for example, the work of William Baden and Christopher Beckman in their edited volume, Nonlinear Models of Archaeology, which draws on approaches developed within mathematics, meteorology, and physics to map, quote, the emergent uh, outcomes of the actions of individual agents. So to summarize, native slipstreaming does away with chronological modes of thinking, which compel archeologists to organize human history into blocks of time, which precede one after another. 
Instead, slipstream thinking imagines native lifeways as webs of relationships situated within multiple temporal frames which are operating simultaneously. This way of thinking leads away from linear cause and effect hypothesis testing and towards a focus on cycles, repetition, and creativity. Slipstreaming as a literary device is one facet of what Visitor calls trickster hermeneutics, a theory and method that disrupts dominant knowledge systems and categories. The goal of trickster hermeneutics is both deconstructive and revisionist. With regards to deconstruction, trickster writers produce narratives that reveal the contradictions within terminal creeds, those beliefs which seek to fix and impose static definitions upon the world. Frederick Jackson Turner's Frontier Thesis is a classic example of a terminal creed here in the United States. Turner's thesis established a series of problematic and denigrating dualisms between European and indigenous peoples, which confirmed assumptions about their inferiority and were subsequently used by federal administrators to justify racialized policies of assimilation and territorial dispossession. As Mike Wilcox points out, these terminal creeds are not just written into federal law, but are ingrained in archeological narratives which purport to explain the collapse of indigenous civilizations or their democratic decline. In order to deconstruct such terminal narratives, Visinor draws on humor, which is an important part of trickster tales within the indigenous oral tradition. Humor as a narrative device is diametrically opposed to the sort of empirical rationalism often found in archeological storytelling. Rather than producing definitive truths, humor creates a space for critical self-reflection, something I think a lot of the panelists have talked about. This kind of critical self-reflection reveals the ironies, tautologies, contradictions, and conflations inherent in archeological discourse. A good example of the power of humor as a narrative device can be found in Vine Deloria's classic text cited by many, uh, Custard Died for Your Sins, in which he uses irony to critique ingrained disciplinary practices in anthropology. In addition to deconstruction, trickster hermeneutics offers a methodology for producing counter narratives. Trickster hermeneutics creates a space for indigenous people in the present, as well as the future, by rejecting archaeological narratives of erasure, tragedy, and victimization. To use visitors' language, archaeologists should be in the business of writing historical narratives, which represent indigenous people as post-Indians. These are individuals and societies that have survived European colonial domination. These are stories of survivance, as Craig talked about. As near as I can tell, writing survivance stories does not entail painting the past as devoid of violence, resistance, disjuncture, or power imbalances but rather that we not paint it as exclusively so. In this sense, survivance stories demonstrate the persistence of indigenous peoples and practices into the present. A growing number of archeologists have taken up Visner's terminology of survivance in various ways to re-examine indigenous experiences of colonization. For instance, in 2018, Heather Walder and Jessica Yan published an edited journal series in the Midwest Archeological Conference Papers in which contributors use the concept of survivance to discuss long-term historical processes of cultural adaptation and resiliency, to discuss the fluidity of social categories, and to highlight indigenous choice and agency within asymmetrical power relationships. Similarly, two recent dissertations, one by Ian Kretzler working with the Grand Redonde Reservation in Oregon, and another by Nathan Sibo working with indigenous communities in Southern California, have drawn on the concept of survivance to reject dominant research discourses, which silence indigenous people, and to practice a type of research methodology in which indigenous voices are incorporated throughout every stage of the process. Visitor describes the process of writing trickster tales as an act of translation between and across author, narrator, character, and reader. 
Historically, archaeologists are the authors, narrators, and readers of indigenous histories, while indigenous people themselves are simply the characters in our narratives. I have to say that this allocation of roles seems a bit unbalanced to me. At its core, trickster hermeneutics challenges archaeologists' traditional role as the exclusive stewards and narrators of native history. Rather than narrators of indigenous history, archaeologists become listeners to and translators of indigenous stories. Positioned within a Native American critical theory, archaeologists are cultural hybrids who have the power to mediate between worlds and worldviews like tricksters do. We are what Visinor refers to as mixed bloods. Archaeologists are paradigmatic mixed bloods in the sense that we must always engage in forms of translation and mediation. Whether we are settler archaeologists writing about native pasts or native archaeologists writing within a settler discipline. Within this framework, stories are the medium through which native presence is brought into the world. The author narrator accomplishes this goal through a kind of dialectical approach in which the reader is asked to ponder over the similarities, differences, and tensions that exist in the past and in our narratives about the past. As Keisha's commentary yesterday brought to light, storytelling operates as a collaborative synergistic methodology. Applying a trickster approach in archeology span requires a kind of reformulation of who the authors, narrators, characters, and readers are of indigenous storytelling. Unlike conventional archeological histories in which human beings are the sole protagonists of the story, Trickster hermeneutics produces a more extensive list of potential characters, including artifacts, people, places, animals, plants, as well as spiritual beings. This decentering of human actors resembles in some ways object agency approaches, which call for an end to anthropocentrism. While trickster hermeneutics posits the existence of power and agency throughout the universe, the protagonists of trickster histories are indigenous people and their relationships, not trees, rocks, artifacts, or whatever else. The reader or listener of archeological trickster tales ought to include a native and non-native public. These stories should sustain native cultural knowledge for a native audience while building cross-cultural understanding and combating harmful narratives for a non-Native audience. In the end, the ideal reader of a trickster narrative is not Native or non-Native per se, but rather it is a person who is willing to put aside their desire for fixed prescriptive definitions and neat explanations of the past. The relationship between author and narrator when transferred from the oral tradition to written text is a little messier than some of these other categories. In some instances, the author and narrator of the story may be the same. For example, when Nick Laluk, White Mountain Apache tribal member, writes in the first person about the indivisibility of land and mind in Ende ontology and the application of this concept to archaeology. In other instances, the author may be separate from the narrator. For example, when Carol Patterson's book, Petroglyphs of Western Colorado, in which Patterson, the author, compiles narratives and interpretations shared by Northern Ute tribal member Clifford Duncan, the narrator, to tell a story about Northern Ute land use practices. Whether the author and narrator are the same or separate voices, self-reflexivity is paramount. We must be aware of our positions, right? Settler, indigenous, federal agent, tribal member, etc., vis-a-vis the archaeological record of indigenous peoples and the assumptions we bring to the interpretation of indigenous history. Trickster hermeneutics not only posits a different formulation of authorship and audience, but also brings with it a different set of theoretical assumptions. As many post-colonial indigenous uh, post-colonial and indigenous scholars have pointed out, the cultural categories and terminologies employed by archaeologists are homogenizing and reductionist and can do harm to living indigenous peoples. For example, terms like archaic or prehistory are damaging to indigenous people 
because they obscure the relationship between indigenous people in the present and their ancestors in the past, while flattening the diversity of indigenous people in the past. While I recognize that such broad categorization is a central part of how archeologists analyze and piece together the past, we should critically examine how these rhetorics serve, albeit perhaps unintentionally, to reinforce settler colonial processes of indigenous disenfranchisement. A trickster hermeneutics challenges such ingrained conceptual categories and ways of organizing knowledge and seeks to develop alternative terminologies or what Visitor calls word arrows. Gregory Younging's Elements of Indigenous Style offers archeologists an important alternative dictionary for how to write about indigenous people and histories, which I argue we would do well to adopt. Trickers are boundary crossers. For Visitor, tribal consciousness is embodied within the trickster figure and rejects the attempts of formal logic to establish fixed either or definitions or the construction of neat causal explanations. The blurriness of categorical boundaries within the oral tradition is demonstrated in a Shoshone story about a woman who transforms into a horse. In this tale, the woman exists in a, a ephemeral bodily state, somewhere between human and horse. As in many trickster tales, she is both and, rather than either or. In the place of neat categories like sacred, profane, male, female, human, non-human, living, and dead, trickster historians embrace what indigenous philosopher Lori Witt refers to as epistemological pluralism. The idea that concepts or events can hold multiple different meanings to different people over time. The practical implications of this are that all data must be constantly considered and reconsidered and that multiple explanations or theories may simultaneously be true. Finally, as suggested by my earlier discussion of slipstreaming, trickster hermeneutics rejects linear time in favor of a circular worldview that can be summarized as all history is now. What this means is that no analytical distinction exists between events which occurred in mythic time, traditionally the purview of origin stories, the deep past, the purview of prehistorians, the past, the purview of historians, or the present, the purview of ethnographers. Collapsing the past-present divide denies the possibility of doing value-neutral research. This approach to narrative history is at odds with arguments put forth by archeologists like Steve Lexen, who would promote a strict division between archeology span and heritage. This position allows archeologists to remain the stewards of archeological prehistory while ceding full authority over cultural heritage to indigenous folks. This approach is problematic because it reinforces the privileged position of archeologists as, a, as more qualified to think, write, and talk about native material culture in the past than native people themselves. Remember, trickster hermeneutics displaces archeologists as the sole narrators of indigenous stories and in the academy. Archeological trickster tales should at their core be about liberating indigenous people in the present. They liberate indigenous people from universalizing Western theories and from tone death representations that pervade cultural histories in North America. These stories can be used by indigenous people to pursue healing and to assert sovereignty. Methodologically applying slipstream thinking and trickster hermeneutics rests upon the incorporation of indigenous voices into the writing of history through upstreaming and sidestreaming approaches. Upstreaming involves using a variety of sources which contain indigenous voices like archival documents, ethnographic texts, oral histories, personal narratives to interpret the archeological record. This is a kind of classic ethno-historic approach. When applied to the deep past, criticism has often abounded around this method with scholars questioning the logical validity of applying contemporary indigenous cultural knowledge to materials from 9,000 years ago. From my perspective, such objections reinforce settler colonial logics of elimination, 
which seek to obscure the, the connection between contemporary indigenous populations and the continent's earliest inhabitants. Slipstreaming and trickster hermeneutics critically disrupts such lines of argumentation by tracing longer term histories which connect indigenous pasts and present. In addition to upstreaming, scholars like Andrew Littman in the Saltwater Frontier have drawn on sidestreaming approaches in which cultural practices and beliefs of similar ethnic groups are compared and used as explanatory lenses with which to examine past practices. This methodology is situated within scholarly efforts to develop a kind of global indigenous ethic based on shared ontological beliefs. Sidestreaming offers another means of producing culturally grounded interpretations of the past that reflect indigenous beliefs, sources, and systems, while opening up a broader discussion around the interconnectedness of indigenous societies and their shared experiences of settler colonialism. Both upstreaming and sidestreaming create a space within archeological narratives for alternative culturally grounded interpretations of the past. In the end, trickster history is about native presencing. It is about humor as a tool of critique and it is about epistemological fluidity. At a basic level, trickster histories are about indigenous futurity. They are about using the archeological text to trace out the connections between indigenous past and present in order to ensure a better future for the next generation. Thank you. Sorry if I went a little over. Can't seem to hear you there, Ed. I think you've lost your audio, Ed. I've quite literally made him speechless. <laughs> Um, maybe, maybe signing in and signing back out might work. Should we, um, should we carry on without him? <laughs> Any questions for Lindsay? <laughs> questions, deep concerns, critiques? <laughs> um, thank you, Lindsay. Um, so I just have a, I've got a couple of quite specific questions, really. Um, you mentioned Lexon at the end and his distinction between um, wanting to, I mean, he says that's in his recent book, isn't it? Yeah. He's kind of, I'm retired now, I can say what I like book. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, that distinction he makes between heritage and archaeology or heritage and prehistory. Yeah. Um, could you talk more about his argument, why he, why he wants to do that? Yeah, well, so that, I, again, obviously, this is my reading of what um, Steve, Steve Lexon is arguing there in his book. Um, but what one of the things he's trying to do is to um, cons to recognize the fact that indigenous people have a have a particular um, place vis-a-vis -vis the archaeological record that's unique within um, the North American context. Um, but he also wants to distinguish what indigenous people bring to archaeology from what archaeologists bring to the study of the past. So he's saying that, you know, archaeologists have a particular skill set that helps them um, narrate the past, and indigenous people have a special skill set and worldview that helps them narrate the past, and that those are really separate things that um, shouldn't be brought together or compared. And in some ways, I agree with him, but the problem to me is if you say indigenous people get control over the heritage narratives and not over what archeologists do, you're just creating another unique space for archeologists to continue with business as usual. So that's, that's kind of my, um, that's my yeah. reading of him. I don't know yeah. if other people have read that that's, his. That sounds really problematic. <laughs> is, he saying, is he saying then that indigenous peoples don't have any say on the 
archaeological on the kind of I don't see where the distinction where so the so the archaeologists can say what they want to say and the indigenous peoples say what they you want to say and that's and the problem is that they're still going to maintain the power imbalance between the two that's kind of my reading of it I don't know if Craig or Keisha have read his arguments and what um maybe clarify explain better than I'm doing <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just said that, you know, this reminds me a lot of uh, the notorious Bob McGee, uh, who doesn't take that argument, but in fact, it's a related argument that indigenous, I'm uh, sorry, uh, archaeologists have specialized knowledge that is superior to all other knowledge. And those of us that say we collaborate with people are just sort of practicing ventriloquism. And that's really wrong because he went fishing with an indigenous person once and they didn't, they use linear time. And that's made them not indigenous to him. Uh, sorry, Bob. Uh, but, but he basically said, you know, archaeologists have their box. And you can be an indigenous person that's an archaeologist as long as you completely adopt that way of knowing the world. Uh, Keisha, I'm sure you have views on this. <laughs> yeah, I have many. <laughs> um, oh, goodness, where, where to start? Uh, so I think, I think this actually shows a really important tension that I've always sat with, which is that there's a distinction between being an archaeologist and being an Indigenous person. And I actually, after yesterday, I think it was the first time ever in my life that I felt that I could be an archaeologist and an Indigenous person all at the same time in one archaeological space, right? Because there is this sense that like Indigenous knowledge is a thing and archaeological knowledge is a thing. And they sometimes speak to each other, but they, they remain separate, sort of divergent, I, I suppose. And I think that the, the arguments, I haven't actually read Lexan, and I will go to it right away because I think this is a really, really important thing, is that it still assumes a certain privilege around the materiality of the past. Um, and this is sort of my whole frustration with, you know, the more distant past means you know, indigenous people aren't as connected to it. And then, but then why does it default to the white archaeologist being, being able to tell that story? And this is the part that I find a lot of disconnect. It's like, why does that become the default position, right? That you somehow can tell that story. According to whom? Those are our lands and our histories. So mm -hmm. if we don't give you the right to tell that story, you taking it without assuming that we have a story to tell about the archaeology. It doesn't mean that the archaeology has no value in telling the stories of the past. I think it absolutely does, but it doesn't. It doesn't take. It doesn't supersede indigenous histories. So when I when I teach my students about this, I think about there are two ways of of narrating, right, of understanding the past. So perfect example for me is the Bering Strait, right? Indigenous communities in general reject this idea that they wandered over about the Bering Strait to come to these lands. Archaeologically, that's the narrative we tell. And how I encourage students to sit in those tensions is to say, okay, Blackfoot folks say, you know, we have always been here. And of course they have, because since they've been Blackfoot, they've been here. Like, like so their origin story is here, regardless of how archaeologists want to narrate that. And the narration of archaeology doesn't disrupt the fact that those people have always been in that place, right? But these are two different ways of narrating the past, but we can't kind of elevate one over the other because it bases, it's based in science and materiality, and the other one is based in story, right? Because otherwise you're saying the science has supremacy over or is, is the truer tale of the past. Can, can you hear me now or? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I get, so uh, I'm going to try to do a better job of um, describing what Lexan is responding to. And he's actually responding directly to folks like me who try to use indigenous thought as theory within archaeology. And so he's kind of saying like, you can use indigenous thought, but, and that's totally valid in and of itself, but it's over here and it's, you're doing like heritage, you're not doing archaeology because archaeology um, has all of these kind of Western worldviews so baked in that you can't really, you can't really do that. Um, and so we can debate whether, you know, whether we can do that, whether we can do this kind of indigenizing of, of um, archaeology or, or whether really what, what I'm doing isn't archaeology at all. 
Well, that means we have to think about what we mean when we say what is archaeology, of course, right? So, I, you know, I think that, I mean, that is an interesting, interesting question, right? To indigenize archaeology and still do archaeology, what does that actually mean? Um, and, I, and I agree with you. I really like the framing of sort of indigenizing versus decolonizing because the lens is quite different. Um, and it does give a certain kind of agency and sort of what does it actually mean to do indigenous archaeology? And um, I mean, as, as someone who does it, I, I would reject the idea that you can't. Yes. Um, I guess the question becomes that can a non-indigenous person do indigenous archaeology in the way that an indigenous person can? Um, and that I think is something to think through, right? And and that I, mean, I don't know if I necessarily have a I want to come down on one side of that or another. I do think though that me doing archaeology of my own history is different than someone who's not Métis doing archaeology of my own history, even if they collaborate really closely with my community. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not quite sure yet how to how to articulate that. So yeah, yeah. Oh, Craig, go ahead. So yeah, just really quickly, you know, one of the things I, I get to do, another many privilege, uh, I, I write about archaeology with a person who's Mohegan and I write with an archaeology who's a person who's indigenous from Colombia and who was, um, uh, as a young, as a baby, was adopted by an affluent white family in Connecticut and he married into the Pequot and grew up Pequot. Mm -hmm. And so we, the way we, the three of us think about archaeology is quite different. And I, I think he would actually tell you that he would agree with you, Keisha, that, you know, um, uh, and, and again, this is my estimation of how he would respond to that, but I think he would say the archaeology he does at Mohegan is quite different from the archaeology that my colleague James Quinn does, because that's his people. And, and we're, so both Jay and I are outsiders, but I'm an outsider in a very different way than Jay is, right? But, uh, but I think you have to recognize all three of those things and more complexity as well as you add more people in, but um, uh, I, I don't think it's the same for me, like I, I was questioning Lindsay, if I can, I don't think I can by myself indigenize anything. I can try to decolonize because I'm related to that colonial force, you know, and so I can try to think through that. And I, I, but I mean, I have to, it has to be grounded again with structural change and real change. But uh, I don't know if I can indigenize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ben. Surely you can help create the conditions for indigenizing. Yeah, I, the the thing that I I really run up against with this the terminology of decolonizing, um, and this is coming out of conversations that I've had with Carrie Thompson and Nick Lamuk, um, is just the the impossibility of undoing anything, because that's what the D right like the D and decolonization implies that we can somehow undo them, or that we could that we can somehow imagine um, a settler, uh, a future in which settlers are not the dominant, um, are not creating the dominant power structures. And I find that to be so impossible to imagine. Um, and, and maybe that makes me like a nihilist. But to, uh, like talking to other indigenous folks who are tribal historic preservation officers and others, and you bring up this idea of decolonization to them and they're like, what is that? <laughs> that's not that's not um realistic uh, sorry <laughs> one of the phrases i play around with is when i do it i call it more than euro colonial archaeology <laughs> but i'm not i'm not kidding i actually use that phrase <laughs> yeah so i think though that Lindsay, this speaks to something really important well two things i think i want to talk about one is the fact that you know, you can decolonize a discipline all you want, but if you're not decolonizing the broader structures of society, it becomes meaningless, right? So we have our little, and then the second piece is we are sitting here in the academy, right? So I can talk all I want and I can enact an MAT archaeology. I can, because I'm doing an academic research project and the space of the academy, however Western and colonial its frameworks are, does actually give me space to do some of that. If I was running a CRM company, I couldn't do archaeology this way because I would be constrained by law, by practice, by different forms of settler colonialism that I can't necessarily decolonize or even indigenize to an extent because they're not determined by those of us who sit around in the academic spaces in the same way. They're determined by policymakers and lawyers and all these other things. And there are ways to change that, but to just sort of talk about our 
our theorizing of the past is not that it's meaningless to do so, it is an important intervention, but we can't forget that the lived experience of, of tribal historic preservation officers is a very different one because they're constantly engaging with CRM, with NAGPRA, with these settler colonial legal federal frameworks that don't actually give them the opportunity to have agent, to have the ability to control what happens with the the remains of their past to an extent, right? So they don't actually get to make those choices. So if we only decolonize within or even indigenize, then we're not getting where we necessarily need to be. I mean, to me, like the, the, the best parallel to that, um, and this is kind of what I was um, thinking about in Rachel's talk about that, that difference between how power circulate, how we theorize power and how power is, um, influencing our lived realities. But the, to me, the parallel is affirmative action, right? You can get more brown people in the room, but just getting more brown people in the room doesn't mean that we've changed, we've minimized the wealth gap between African Americans and indigenous folks uh, and the rest of society, right? So it is, you do have to, that's kind of what I meant by we, we can't do value neutral research. So everything that we do within the academy also has to speak to or be situated within what's happening in the larger kind of social context. Um, if we if we want to really like be kind of serious or holistic about um, kind of change and in indigenizing. And to think you do value neutral or apolitical archaeology is to be privileged. <laughs> Because those of us who are not in positions of privilege cannot do it that I mean, we, nobody does it that way, but we cannot not see sort of, and Ollie, I think you, you really were able to articulate that from someone who sits in that majoritarian world to say, you know, you don't have to notice the systems of power, but some of us do every single day in our lived experience. And therefore, everything we do is always engaged with that. And of course, we're all part of it. Just the visibility of it depends on, on privilege. Um, but I do, you know, one more thing, Lindsay, just to, to note, I really appreciated your, your call to humor because I think this is such a subversive part of indigenous theorizing in general and just interaction, the role of humor to like the trickster, right? I love, I really uh, was inspired by that. And I'm just going to put in the chat, uh, people may be familiar with it, but uh, Bernie Perley um, did a series of comics about anthropology and they have uh, the Lone Ranger and Tonto and he's Mal Seat from, from New Brunswick and they are just a perfect example of the sort of humor that can be used to really unsettle some of the things that we do. So I'm just gonna throw the link in the chat because if you not if you haven't read them, you, you, I, I think humor here is so powerful. And Deloria obviously is like the kind of godfather of, of poking fun at uh, anthropology um, from within an academic space. Um, but it's it's really powerful because it makes us realize like that. You know, in some ways, what we do is very serious, and it's, in some ways, like we take ourselves too seriously. Like that—that that what what we're the way that we um, why we have so such entrenched feelings. It makes us question why we have such entrenched feelings um, about these narratives of the past, um, particularly when we're writing narratives about the past of people that aren't even related to us. <laughs> and the further back in the past you get. The, I find the worst that gets too. <laughs> so anyway. Ollie, go ahead. Well, just to follow up on that humor point, I was really I was really struck by that as well. And it's something you're really good at, Lindsay, is being funny and but making a point at the same time. Like when you slap me and bend down for being two white guys having a conversation, which was both really funny and really an excellent political point to make in that context, right? But I was and I try and when I'm using humor badly in the main oh cute kid on the screen everyone be looking at that and not listening to me that's probably for the best um I, i'm kind of doing to try and undermine some of my position particularly i try and do it in lectures to kind of disarm students so that they don't feel quite as threatened by the concepts that i'm throwing around and all those sorts of things but i was wondering if there's a kind of what some of the risks are with humor because is it a position like there seems to me the particularly kind of it's really interesting to hear a kind of indigenous perspective on the power of humor because I, I've worried sometimes that my use of humor is a kind of privilege that I can get away with because my authority isn't in question and so if I make jokes about being you know whatever it might be it's not undermining the kind of 
in a certain audience, the academic rigor of what I'm putting across in their eyes, whereas it could be seen. I, I've worried that by my using humor, I'm kind of preventing other people from, I don't know, do you see what I mean about the kind of risks that it's, it's a kind of privilege to use it, I've sometimes felt. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, because there's humor that's subversive, and then there's humor that's a kind of re, uh, a reinforcement of um, power hierarchies, right? The people, if there's a pause and people don't know, should we laugh? Was that a joke or was he, was he serious? Um, and I, I do, I definitely hear what you're saying, especially in this, in the kind of world in which we live, in which political correctness has become the kind of um, canon of the day and any kind of, you, you feel like you can't say anything without being politically incorrect. Um, so I, I hear what you're saying. What I would say is kind of, to me, like humor is actually the privilege of the oppressed because you're in a position in which every, like you, you don't have to think about, I, about being, um, about asserting your kind of privilege, but it, or asserting your power, it, it, that it, it's always um, a kind of subversive tool. And it's also, as Visner talks about in his work, humor is not only subversive, but it's healing. It's a way of, of creating connections between people because you get what I got. You think that what I was thinking was funny without me um, having to spell it out for you. So it's a way of like creating community. But I, he I hear what you're saying with that tension. And I guess it, it, I get, it comes back to this issue that we've all been talking about, about positionality, how we, where are we positioned in how we're using the discourses. That was kind of sorry. <laughs> okay, I know you have your, your hand up and end, but I just really wanted to respond to Ollie really quickly. Um, and I think there's a difference between being a joker and a trickster. And I think it's a really, really important distinction. So when Visner uses trickster her hermeneutics, he's doing it on purpose because the trickster is not just a joker. It's a very subversive figure. In the trickster stories within Indigenous context, it's always something subversive, something unsettling. Some, so the, it, the use of trickster as, as a form of humor is a way to unsettle, whereas to be a joker is to diminish, right? Is to sort of like downplay. And the trickster actually does the opposite. It exposes those things as opposed to dismisses them. And so for me, that's kind of how I distinguish between it. A trickster is not the same thing as someone who's a joker, right? Th those are very two very different forms of humor that do different things. Wow, that's really good. Yeah, I like that phrasing. Craig, did you want to say something? Or, so, <laughs> are there questions? I didn't look. There are some questions, yeah. Okay. Where do they begin? I'm just wondering if we can dismiss some of the older comments because it's getting really busy in the Q&A. Let's see. Should I start? Um, I can't. Sorry, I'm, I've never used this Q and A format. Sorry, but I thought there was one from Catherine that was posed to you. Uh, am I right about that? Or I see. Yeah, I think someone dismissed it by accident. Hang on, Catherine. Do you want to? Oh yeah, could. It... Why don't you make your voice heard, if you don't mind? <laughs> I'll pull her up here. Or, here thank you. Here we go. Allowed to talk. There we go. Oh. Hi. Um, thank you very much for your, for your talk. Everybody for your talks. It's been such an amazing day. Um, I just, my question just was, I was really happy and uh, to hear all of you talk about the process of your research and self-reflection. Uh, and I think it was Ollie who said, you know, this process sort of has changed the way you look in the, at the world or you are in the world. And um, I mean, I think this comes from our experience, maybe in where we are in life, but I wondered if there were ways that we need to reconsider things like undergraduate education to foster these kinds of ways of thinking about the past much earlier because I, I mean, I'm in a teaching position at U of T and I feel like what I'm doing is 
building up models, taking them down, building up models, taking them down. And I, that doesn't seem productive to me. So I wanna start doing this right away. Um, so I, I guess I'm just wondering if you feel the same way or have you made important changes or how, what kinds of changes do you think might be needed in undergraduate education? Yeah, I mean, I think to be honest, we spend, and I'm guilty of this as much as anybody else who's on the kind of tenure track trajectory of um, uh, using articles and book chapters to make our, our interventions as opposed to um, making pedagogical interventions, which I think is actually a, in many ways much more powerful place to, to start this kind of indigenizing or decolonizing um, process. So I, I agree. I think. Why is it that in our grad theory classes, we still start with all the old dead white guys? Like who needs yeah. to know what Malinowski thought? Nobody uses that shit anymore. <laughs> like, it's loads yeah. of things that people do use now, right? Um, so to me, like that's at the graduate level, at the undergraduate level too. I mean, you look at any introductory to world prehistory, world archeology span textbook, it's gonna start with these kind of narratives of development. And, and it's hard from a Native North American um, position to see where you fit in that, in that narrative. Um, so I think, yeah, like restructuring from the beginning how we um, teach these kind of concepts and what we say are the core concepts is really important. And this is just to respond to somebody in the Q&A who asked about the term unsettling versus decolonizing. I think unsettling is actually a good way to think about how to restructure our pedagogies because unsettling uh, involves thinking about what are the kind of narratives that have supported settler existence in, in yeah. North America and how, how might we um, undo those? Thanks. I think that's um, a really good question about pedagogy, Catherine. It's something that I'm trying to work through in my peregrination around different um, institutions, teaching lots of different places. And I know that Ollie and Rachel are doing a similar thing in their in their theory course that maybe they'd like to speak to in a, in a minute. Um, is is teaching through dialogue rather than through teleology? I think it's very easy to sort of click into a theory mode where we talk about this progression through um, a teleology of thought, um, whereas teaching thematically and teaching in conversation um, and modelling modeling the ability to have polite disagreements with each other, to fundamentally disagree with each other and still come out as friends at the end of it, maybe. Um, but like to have the conversation is the important thing, right? Um, and one, so one of the ways that I'm trying to do that is to, to bring those conversations into the classroom and um, actively disagree with colleagues and for that to be fine. Um, and the, the other way is to try and meet students where they are and have conversations about what their experience is and how that is not the experience of everybody in this space. And even in even in classrooms that are not particularly diverse, there's always going to be a variety of experiences of, um, of perspectives that, that our students bring. And I think taking taking those perspectives seriously is a really great place to start. Um, asking people to, to engage with a, a wider variety of, of theory. Great, thank you. Um, so KP, I put a, an article, a link to an article in the chat because I actually just published about this because I think it's, the, it's a really fundamental right. thing, which is we can write articles that, you know, a few people will read or we can teach hundreds of students. And, and I think that even if those students don't become archaeologists, teaching them in, in ways that unsettle actually does all of society um, a service, right? Because archaeology can be a way, an, an entry point to, to think about the structures of imperialism, colonialism, and, and the histories of, no, of certain knowledge systems and how they have marginalized. That even if, if our students don't end up practicing archaeology, they, they can take that with them. And uh, I've been doing that progressively earlier and earlier in my teaching. Um, because I, I taught a, a senior undergraduate course where I was introducing students, I mean, asking a simple question of what gives archaeologists the right to study Indigenous pasts, like, it actually blew their minds. And they're like, why did nobody ask us this before? Like, why haven't we encountered this before? And I was like, okay, so I need to do this in the first 
the first level that I teach. And so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not teaching a lot right now, but when I am, I will be reimagining my intro course completely yeah. because I, I'm, I'm going to reframe it entirely differently than I did. It doesn't mean they're still not going to learn about how we actually do archaeology because that's what our intro course is supposed to do, but they're going to learn about it in a very different way. Um, so I hope the paper is it's in a Canadian context and it did sort of looked at how intro to archaeology is taught wherever we could find sort of syllabi and descriptions of courses and calls for us to do more, especially in the lands we call Canada, about engaging with Indigenous knowledges, but where people are situated will partly determine how they frame that. Because Sophie, I think your question of conversation is a good one. At the same time, as an Indigenous person in those spaces, I don't feel like I can converse always because there is a power dynamic at play. And so for myself as an Indigenous instructor, I try to create a space where my Indigenous students feel that they can speak and they don't also have to represent whatever position, like they don't have to represent all Indigenous people. Just like as a woman, I can't represent all women, right? Um, and they tend to get othered in that way if the space is not very carefully created. So I think there's a lot of learning that we need to do as instructors, but I think it's an absolutely essential part of how we need to move forward. I totally agree. Great. I really want to look at that. Thanks. That's exactly where I am. First year course. Anyway, sorry. I'll mute myself now. <laughs> Ollie, did you, sorry, Ollie, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I did. I was, I was just going to say two, two things. One, uh, there's a, a book I had on a slide earlier by uh, Hannah Cobb and Karina Croucher called Assembling Archaeology, or Assembling Archaeologists, um, which is a really fantastic book about teaching uh, archaeology, which is trying to think through the kind of, if we take some of the principles of relationality seriously, for example, what does that mean for how we conceptualize what it is to become an archaeologist and to teach students and to train them? Um, so I, that's something that I've found very profoundly influential um, myself and hopefully I think will be widely read and used by people. Um, and the other thing is just, Sophie mentioned it, but Rachel and I teach a course together where we try and get students to think through these kinds of issues in different kinds of ways. And we try to use a range of media to do that. So we use podcasts and we use YouTube videos of philosophers and um, Indigenous people. We use All My Relations podcasts, particularly as a means of introducing our students who are, I mean, we don't have, who are entirely ignorant about the existence of indigenous worlds full stop let alone indigenous thinking in any kind of sense to introduce you to some, some of those ideas but then we also try and tie that always back to the material um, from the Neolithic and Bronze Age particularly to think through issues of power and difference and gender and identity and those sorts of things and we found that hopefully quite successful in getting them to decenter some of their assumptions about the world and begin to disrupt that and I just I think Keisha's point is absolutely right that whether they become archaeologists or not is kind of irrelevant as to the purpose of teaching this stuff. I mean, I don't give the smallest shit if my students know the sequence of Neolithic British pottery by the time they leave the course. It's entirely irrelevant. Frankly, I can hardly be bothered to remember it. But if they understand that their own conceptions of personhood or gender or power relations are particularly and historically emergent and it's caught up in a complex history of colonialism and other things like that, then that's far more important and a relevant thing for them to come out of a degree with than any kind of like specific piece of archaeological knowledge. Yeah, no, I agree completely. I completely. Thank you. To build a tiny bit on that and thinking about what Keisha said, one of the things um, that is, is hard about that is creating that um, space that allows the students to kind of, um, one, say things that they aren't sure whether they're right or not, and two, people who come from diverse backgrounds, giving them the space to feel that they can say and talk and all of those kinds of things. And in some ways, co-teaching the course makes it easier because in some instances we can rely on the fact that Ollie and I can take opposing views or we can talk about our own experiences and we're happy to bring in our own experiences of all kinds of things to the classroom and attempt to use that to kind of make things more comfortable. But I still I actually think we're only a tiny bit of the way there at creating that space that's going to allow much more of that to come out. And that is just a journey that I'm... Um, I think it's challenging for everybody to because I know there are still people that sit there in that classroom quiet and then you see in their work that they've engaged in some 
really kind of interesting and complex introspection relating to their position within the field and all kinds of things like that. And you, you see it come out in the essay. They've sat quiet in the class. And in one sense, that's absolutely fine. But I worry that we weren't able to give them that space that they could say those things out loud in the class as well. And that is a challenge. Lindsay. I, I mean, I think you're really pointing out that what you just said really resonates with me because as a as a student throughout in my graduate career, like I did not talk. I didn't feel like, uh, I didn't feel comfortable in, in seminar spaces talking. Um, and, and some of that is, some of it is the space itself and the way that the, the dynamics of the course were constructed, right? And that's something that you guys as instructors or I as an instructor can control. And, but other, the other side of it is, what, what are the types of ways that we value contribution? And does it always have to be one way or the other, right? Does it always have to be that you're the person who speaks up in class is the one that we think is the brightest and the most engaged? Or are there different ways that we can put these different types of um, pedagogical learning, um, learning mechanisms into equal standing and say like, it's okay if you just want to write about it. Maybe you come from a tradition where you're not supposed to challenge uh, other people's knowledge, where you're not supposed to um, talk about, uh, challenge dominant ideas or the professor's ideas. Um, and that if we insist that everybody has to like follow the same rules, maybe we're, we're not really um, being as like open to these different types of ways that people come at knowledge as we could be. I think, you know, Lindsay, I was going to say, um, one of the things that I always try to remember is what I'm trying to do when I teach is I'm trying to learn something as well and being open to that and just remembering to be open to that rather than just like I'm a t it's a top down sort of flow of knowledge. So that's one of the things I remember, you know, I try to keep in mind as I from my own privileged position. Um, just very quickly, Catherine, thanks for the question. I, I am actually at a heavily uh, teaching oriented institution so we are given a lot of it's there's a lot of weight given to teaching and so I agree with um, Keisha that you know we have an opportunity to change a lot of people's minds also or to influence them in a certain way also we don't have a major in archaeology we don't even have a major in anthropology where I am so I feel no obligation to to stick to any kind of uh, 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 disciplinary canons when I'm teaching so I can teach simply as a form of thinking and critique which is lovely but um, in terms of the the power dynamic within the classroom uh, is absolutely crucial. And um, to so there's a reading, uh, Bell Hooks is who I have my students read uh, a chapter and I'm, trying, I'm looking up the reference because I can't remember it now. Uh, but I have them read a chapter from Bell Hooks who talks about these silences and the power differential in the classroom and how to account for it. And I also agree with uh, Lindsay that, um, you know, at least in North America, there's a heavy emphasis on extrovert, extrovert uh, personalities which means that we always give grade for participation. Maybe we shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> that's a that's a that's a heavily kind of or, uh, heavily weighted um, cultural expectation that people will talk, and especially when you've got power dynamics in the classroom. That's all I have to say about that. Bell hook. I mean, that, yeah, I think that's um, really how to create those environments, I think is a really important question. Um, so I just wanted to share with you one of the things that I've taken to doing, and, and I was partly inspired by trying to create um, as safe of environments as I can for things like field work, right? Where we know there's a lot of problems and a lot of people get the power dynamics, certainly I mean that people experience all kinds of abuse and harassment in, in field environments. But this is actually something I've started applying to all classrooms. And that's, we start off with a conversation which I call principles of community. And this is a, a phrase that's starting to be used in a number of different settings. And some of this comes out in the Archaeologists of the Heart work that I've been doing um, with Sonia Adelaide, Jane Baxter, and Natasha Lyons. And um, what this exercise does is it starts with a conversation about, you know, kind of, and everyone contributes. So you do it in, you know, again, in a 300 person classroom, this might be harder, but in a smaller classroom, um, you can just basically have a conversation about what is, what are the ways in 
what are the values that we hold collectively and how do we want to engage with one another, right? So what are the ways in which we want to engage in this classroom? So we don't kind of go in and just sort of start by, I'm the instructor, you're the students, and we're going to talk about things, but we actually talk about the community we're creating in that space to begin with and sort of exposing some of those silences, you know, what are some of the things we need to consider and then talking about how we want to engage with one another so that when we are having dialogue, that we've already said to people, you need to be aware if you're taking up too much space in this dialogue, right? That you know we value that everyone has a chance to have the space to speak and be heard. And if you're talking all the time, then we can all call collectively say, hey, you know, maybe you need to take a step back. And it's not me sort of dictating that, but it's everyone buys in. Um, and so this is just one activity that I do, which is this sort of co-created principles of community that at least is a, is a place to open up that conversation. And it sometimes works better than others, but at least gives you a tool that you can start to think about in, in pedagogical spaces or in research spaces even, is how you work together um, and actually exposing all those things that we kind of almost take for granted that sit there as silences. There's some additional questions for you, Lindsay, in the uh, Q&A. So there's a question here that um, is from a student, uh, and it's kind of addressed to Keisha, Craig, and myself about this idea of appropriation, which is also something that Rachel talked about and worried over about using Indigenous theory. And basically, they're asking, you know, at the risk of sounding nihilistic, is it inherently colonial to think that I and my settler colleagues have anything meaningful to contribute to Indigenous histories or the telling of Indigenous histories? And how can, um, how can you move forward in a productive way? So I'll actually uh, uh, give it to the settler colonial archaeologist first and <laughs> see what he says. <laughs> Yeah, I was once giving a paper and Sim Schneider introduced me by accident as Colonial Craig Zappola. And I was like, yep, that's right. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, uh, so I, I, I think, I don't, I'm not going to be able to give you an answer to this. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just going to lay it on the table. But I, I think it's a, a very important question. It's a question that we should always be asking ourselves. Am I needed here right now? I don't know about the sort of you know, Craig, what can he contribute to all Indigenous history in North America? I don't know if that's a question I need to ask, but when I go and I work on Mohegan land, I'm always asking, like, do I need to be here right now? And, uh, and the Mohegan asked the same question, by the way, and we keep uh, an honest and open discussion of that, right? What, what would it look like if we work, work together for another five years? What, what could we get out of that? So, so I think it's about sacrificing the, the sort of the traditional power of archaeology to come in and to know and to do what we want and to be open to and self-reflexive as, as much as possible uh, to, to when it's time to go, it's time to go. Um, but I don't know about the broader question. Um, you know, I study colonialism and I do think, I don't know if I have anything valuable to give to indigenous histories by itself, but I do think I have something to contribute to understanding what colonialism is and what the future might look like uh, 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 in, in North America. So uh, by looking at our, our colonial history, that's all I can say, it's not a very good answer. So maybe I'll, I'll jump in here too. And I think, I do think that we need to be critical of performative collaboration and what I would term a settler move to innocence. So coming back to Tuck and Yang. Um, and I do think there is some of that that happens in archaeology and it's easy to fall into that trap. That being said, um, I think a lot of Indigenous communities are very interested in archaeology and we don't want to diminish the fact that archaeology... So I'm, I'm giving a talk next week. Uh, well, I'm not giving a talk. I'm on a panel talking about an archaeology of redress and restorative justice. And I think this is a place where um, the techniques of archaeology can bring out the silences of history at times. Um, and, and for better or for worse, can be used to demonstrate, for example, the, the depth and vibrancy of Indigenous histories. And Indigenous folks, you don't need to tell us that, but we need your help to tell other people that, right? So this idea that you can help to support um, Indigenous, you know, telling of Indigenous histories, I think there is a role. 
But I do think we need to be moving toward indigenous driven, indigenous led projects in the lands we call North America as much as possible. So the work that I do in my institute, the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology, is really moving toward community driven projects. Communities come to us, whether my community or others, and they say, we have this thing we want to do. Right now, a lot of people want to help us, want help finding graves. We can do that. Both settler and, and Indigenous archaeologists, we have the we have the technology, the knowledge, the expertise, and they come to us and say, hey, we want to do this thing. And then we say, all right, well, how do we do this? We'll get the funding. You know, we can do this. And then we have an ongoing conversation about our partnership. What, you know, and we explain, you know, okay, if graduate students are involved, they do have to write theses. So we need to talk about how that's going to work. But, but there is desire from, I think, Indigenous communities sometimes to have archaeology done. And we don't want to you know, be paternalistic about that and say, well, I, I can't do that because I'm not Indigenous. If they want to do it, then I think there's ways to do it that are ethical as a non-Indigenous person. Yeah, I would just build on what Craig and Keisha were saying. And I, I really like the way that Craig uh, phrased it. You have to ask, am I needed here? Um, and to, to just be really real about the situation, there's not that many Indigenous people who are trained as archaeologists right now. So even if all everybody, all non-Indigenous archaeologists pulled out and they said, okay, we're not going to talk about Indigenous history anymore, that wouldn't solve the problem because there's still, as Keisha points out, there's still a great need for a, for a lot of Indigenous communities to have archaeology done on their lands and they want to use archaeology as a tool for asserting their own sovereignty um, in terms of land rights and, and pedagogy and, and representation and museum context. So to me, like the, the one of the questions that you want to ask is not only am I needed here, but what are the what is most interesting to the people who I want to study or want to work with, right? As opposed to how we're traditionally taught to come in and everybody, you have to write in your graduate proposal, what's your research question? What's your research topic, right? From a really kind of um, unsettling way, you can't, you can't approach it like that. You have to say, you have to first start with the relations. You have to first start by going to a community where you want to that you want to work with and ask them, what am I needed here? And what's interesting to you? And then you can find the things this is just speaking from my own personal experience. And then you can find the things from within what they find interesting or relevant to what you also find interesting and relevant. But you have to start with the relations as opposed to your question and how you're going to figure out how to solve it. Hey. Oh, man. Uh, sorry. What? <laughs> Am I supposed to say? Uh, can I talk? Um, what I was going to say, uh, Lindsay, is you know, I, I always sort of think of the alternative where we all have our own specialized fall. I'm from nowhere, like Ben said, I'm from nowhere too. I'm floating in space. Like if we all have our own specialized, I guess I'm gonna go do the archeology span of like Roman history or something, which I, I would find terribly boring. But um, um, uh, I think if we think of the alternative where we don't have, have our own box that we live in and study, I actually think that's a really bad way to do things as well. I don't think that my, the students that I am lucky enough to have that are indigenous, I hope they go on to not just become archaeologists. I hope they become, they go study Roman history or they go do something more useful than that, even like chemistry or or whatever, a uh, philosophy. That's not very useful. Uh, something useful. I can't come up with anything useful right now. But um, the point is that I think this looking at difference in a productive way to go back to something Ollie and, both, and Rachel have both taught me. And both these two people have really taught me a lot uh, uh, about uh, the, making it a productive relationship. And I think if anthropology wasn't so like racist and stuff, uh, it would be about learning from each other in a non-hierarchical way, right? We can sit and learn from each other and learn across those lines of difference. Uh, and I think that would be a, a great way to go about things. So I, th I again, like I always think of the alternative. Do we just tell like people like like we no no like go do something else, go, go with Ollie. Maybe he'll let you dig a Neolithic site or something. I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> but I, I, you know, again, I think, I think difference does, isn't always bad. Um, it has been really bad in North America, right? Those that, different people studying different histories, but it doesn't have to be, it can be, like I think at Mohegan, we actually value each other's, what, what, what comes out of our relationship. And we, we would agree that what comes out is different from what we would produce separately about the, you know, the past that we talk about and things.
Thank you, Craig. There's people are still have some energy and enjoying the conversation. Lindsay, you've been on for a while. There's two more questions for you or perhaps all the panel from Anonymous. Um, this is kind of building actually on the point that Craig just made, but there's another question about, and I think this is maybe something that all the panelists might want to um, weigh in on here is, People, how do you, they, they ask, what are your thoughts about scholars working outside their cultural spaces and areas that have experienced different kinds of colonial histories than the Americas? Um, so such as North American archeologists, um, indigenous or not working in Europe or European archeologists working in indigenous contexts. So that, that it's kind of a general question on, on um, working in different cultural sp spaces. Yeah, Ali. I mean, Ben mentioned this yesterday briefly, but I mean, a kind of classic late 90s example is Parker Pearson and Romelu Sonina's paper on Stonehenge, right, where a Malagasy archaeologist comes to Stonehenge, suggests that Stonehenge is for the ancestors in a, as a form of analogy with his uh, his people in, in Madagascar. Now, in the late 90s, this is like pitched as, as a relational analogy and it's dressed up in the kind of language of the times, right? And that's problematic in all kinds of different ways. But that idea has kick-started massive landscape projects around some of the best studied archaeological sites in the world. We now know an enormous amount about that landscape that we didn't do, stimulated by that piece of interaction and ideas that came out from that. So I think you could do actually a much more interesting piece of, um, you could write that piece very differently and probably Mike would, you know, I don't, you know, in the, the late 1990s was a very different place in British archaeology from where it is now in some ways, about maybe it's not different enough, but I think that's just one little example of where an idea of someone from a different part of the world coming to the kind of, to the to Stonehenge, which is kind of like the archaeological centre in some ways, right, as if you're going to monumentalise it, Stonehenge might be the place you'd pick and transforming the way archaeologists think about that. And people are re still wrestling with those ideas right now. We expect the uh, volumes on the Durrington Walls excavations out any minute, kind of, which is the ramifications of that one interaction. So from that perspective, I think it could be immensely productive um, in terms of the way in which that could stimulate all kinds of new ideas and new kinds of dialogues. Because if that one did it, when it was positioned within a kind of, um, an, 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 a post-processual form of analogy, what could you do with the same thing repositioned within ontological perspectives, post-humanism, new materialism, all these other kinds of theoretical things, giving these voices a very different kind of weight from, this is just a suggestion to other kinds of ways of engaging with that material. That's just my take. Well, this is something that we actually um, talk a little bit about in the book um, is, is this kind of translation and and um, being in different cultural spaces. And in the book, we give um, this example of Sonia Adelaide as well, who went to Chateau Hulyuk in Turkey and brought indigenous methodologies of collaboration into a non-indigenous space. Um, and she has a couple of articles where she talks about that experience and the kind of tensions of trying to apply an indigenous um, Anishinaabe framework uh, in that different context, but also how valuable it was to like bring collaborative methodologies into a space in which um, that wasn't the norm or wasn't becoming the norm. Some of my favorite field work I've ever done is bringing, when I worked at the University of Leicester with, uh, with these two, uh, bringing British students to do archaeology with the Mohegan and, and dig up sites that were both British, British influenced at least, and, and, and Mohegan. And um, I think if you were to go and ask Mohegan people and the students that are now doing the archaeology as, as jobs, uh, I think they would say like, that was just no time like that because you got these conversations that were just out of this world. And I would, I would just go into the woods. Uh, this is gonna sound weird, but I would be like I'm over on the side of the woods and I'd be just listening to the conversation between a British person and a Mohegan person talking about Jamestown or something straight, you know, and it's just like really rich uh, interaction. And we tried to create it so those voices could actually live with each other and not one was on top of the other. But um, I think that's why field work is so great sometimes is you can create those moments that are magical. To add a tiny bit onto that, I agree with all those things that have been said that it has this kind of really powerful potential.
I think you always have to kind of frame the beginning of that in the right way, though. So thinking about being open about your positionality and that kind of divide that uh, Keisha spoke about between being kind of inside the system and outside the system and what your different goals are there for and what you need to think about um, and how you need to be how if, if I was going to go and work with an indigenous group in the Americas, obviously I'd want to be uh, open and listening and taking all of that seriously. And if I was to have an indigenous colleague come and work with me, I'd like them to be really kind of, you know, um, happy to say, oh, why can't we do this completely differently? The way you're doing this makes no sense. I, I think kind of thinking about those power relations and the situating that we do at the beginning and not just kind of being like, all right, we're going to dig a hole now and kind of letting all of that snowball away, but taking the time at the beginning of that project to be, who are we and what do we want to get out to this and where do we kind of come from? And I think when you have those kinds of conversations at the start, it's a really kind of a, a powerful tool for um, creating the right kind of community and learning together in the kind of example that Craig gave there with the conversations between the Leicester students and the Mohegan is a really good example of that and it's about creating the conditions where that can happen I think. Thank you Rachel, yes. What a great conversation. Does anyone have anything else to add or say? Is there any other questions that I may have missed in the Q&A? I think they were mostly covered, I believe. I have something to say. Uh, thank you so much to Ed and the Archaeology Center, uh, Ken and Hillary and Paula. Thank you so much for, uh, for welcoming us all and, and actually for allowing me to invite uh, a lot of people uh, that I found really interesting. Um, uh, so thanks, thanks so much for uh, the great job you've done, uh, making it a Zoom meeting and everything else. Uh, we, it's just really great. Well, thank you, Craig, and thanks to all of you. We're very grateful and appreciate your ability to speak and participate. I think this worked very well, despite the circumstances. As I mentioned, it would have been much nicer to have you here all in person as we planned when the invitations were sent out in, in the fall. But this will be an annual event in early October before Canadian Thanksgiving. Sometimes it can still be short sleeve weather here. It's a nice time of year in, in TO. And as Hillary mentioned, we do often have talks or workshops weekly that are now all uh, resuming digitally. So if you're interested, you can get our weekly mailing. And uh, we'll hope to, I feel like I've met you all. That's what's so nice. And, and it's, that's what's surreal about this uh, for many of you who I haven't met. But you always have an open invitation to come to Toronto. We were supposed to wine and dine you and put you in nice hotels and things. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> next time, maybe. And, uh, and of course, if anyone has themes for future years, for future events, uh, please let me know. And thank you, Craig, too, for because we do, in fact, solicit proposals for the debates. That we And so it's, we're very grateful to have them. I certainly can't come up with all the ideas. <laughs> that would be a bad idea. Um, so really everyone to all all seven speakers and to paula and ken and hillary really thank you for all for all that you've done and for making this successful and it was a nice escape to alternative worlds al alternative ontologies perhaps from the grind and and i hope everyone stays ha happy and healthy and safe and that things do improve so thank you all very much thank you Thanks. It's been wonderful. Really invigorating. Yeah. Thank you, Thanks, Fascinating and, and invigorating and, and very nice to meet you all virtually and, and uh, stay safe. And, and thank you for, thank you for your patience as well. This is uh, the Zoom tedium for everybody. I'm sure it's uh, extending into the weekend can be tough. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for everyone for attending too. We really appreciated your commentary and your critical, important questions. And so it's, we saw, saw a lot of familiar faces from people across North America and across uh, Europe and elsewhere, which is great. So thank you. And this is the awkward part is how do you, leaving? <laughs> can you just pull the plug, Ken? Maybe you should do that or Hillary. It makes it less awkward for us. Yeah. Yeah. I handed the torch over to Hillary, so she'll Hillary have to hit the paper. Hillary,
That's yeah. so awkward. <laughs> and thank you for Britain too for being so late there. Get some good sleep. Yeah. 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 Thanks everybody. Bye, Thanks everybody. Bye. 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 See you on Monday, Rach. <laughs>